welcome to another amazing episode of Say It Online, where we help digital agency owners stop just randomly shouting into the void and start communicating meaningfully and effectively in this digital age. I'm your host, Say Gabriel, and this episode was brought to you by our sponsor, Nancy Content. If you're sick of conversion content being a huge pain in your agency's butt, especially websites, campaigns, etc., let's talk. With the smoothest content process ever, a team of unbelievably skilled and organized content strategists and years of subcontracting experience, Anansi is looking to make your life as a digital agency owner unbelievably easier. Just head, if you're interested, to anansicontent.com, that's A-N-A-N-S-I content.com, and hit Let's Talk. And now, without further ado, here's our episode. Hello, everybody. I am here today with an interview that, surprise, surprise, I'm super excited about. Actually, a longtime friend of mine and one of my first clients ever, Natasha Votipka. Now, Natasha, a veteran interactive designer and web developer and digital consultant with over 20 years of experience, combines both creative and technical skill sets with extensive project management experience to bring rich interactive experiences to your audience. As a digital consultant, she works to create a clear and detailed digital strategy for your business and online marketing, social strategies, and user experience. Now, on a more personal note, Natasha is someone I've known for a long, long time who has really stuck out at, uh, stuck out to me in terms of her work, not only with her like just amazing attention to detail in terms of design. She actually helped us pick up pick out all of the photos for our website when we'd been like tearing out our head and like unable to figure out how to make it work with our brand. Um, She is also someone who is just highly, highly organized. And more than anything else, Natasha has actually been an inspiration to me for literally years because she is someone who runs her own business as a solopreneur, does most of the work herself, is really, really fantastic, doing a really fantastic job when she does it, but is also basically a full-time mom um, and uh, has managed to kind of uh, work her business around her life instead of, you know, making her life work around her business. Uh, and that is something that I think we can all uh, aspire to and admire quite a bit. So we're going to be digging into stuff uh, very much on the real talk side here, but uh, I just want to welcome you to the show, Natasha. Super stoked to chat with you here today. Thank you. And thank you for the great intro. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's hard to not get carried away sometimes when I'm interviewing someone that I like know and love like you because I just want to go on and on and on about how awesome you are. So, <laughs> <laughs> But uh, anyway, this uh, this is really great. It's an opportunity as uh, I think we're both on the same page in terms of just loving to talk and share um, about our respective lives. And this is a real treat for me to be able to share your story with our listeners. Um, so why don't you just start by, you know, introducing yourself, giving us a little bit of your background and how you came to be where you are today. So I have been doing this for over 20 years. I went to school for graphic design. And then um, as I was getting closer to graduating, the whole internet started. So I started with web design there. And believe it or not, I um, got my first job doing interactive CD-ROMs. So I was, you know, websites back then weren't really interactive, So I would develop the CD-ROMs with the video and the cool graphics and everything. And that was my bread and butter for like two or three years. And then the internet exploded from there. Um, And then I really took my solo career and kind of left the PR industries and and the agencies in New York City um, once my, my son was born. And I thought that I would do it just for a little while, but uh, I came to realize that it was so important for me to stay at home and watch my son grow up and then eventually my daughter, which I had two years later. Um, so I've been doing the, the solopreneurs uh, since 2008. Wow, that is, uh, that's 
awesome that those two things kind of evolved at the same time. And that's a lot of years for, you know, things to change at home as your kids grow up as well as with your business. Uh, So, uh, you know, I'm curious, how has your business evolved over time? Have you kind of adjusted it to put in kind of more or little time as you had the space or has your business model evolved to kind of support the lifestyle that you wanted? Or what does that look like? Yeah, so you know, when I first started, you you start off as a freelancer and uh, you're just trying to get any gig around and you're working all crazy hours because your your baby is sleeping <laughs> all different hours. So sometimes you're working very early in the morning and sometimes you're working late at night. And then I found myself, um, you know, putting in a lot of extra work where I I was missing things or I was just saying, okay, let me just do this one more thing and let, you know, be a little bit more sleep deprived or, or miss uh, going to work out of the gym. So there wasn't really any balance to it. And for my second child, I was like, I, I'm just not going to do this. I'm not going to let the clients rule uh, my work hours and when they can get can get in touch with me because you know it, it would be at night it would be on weekends and once you give them the nights and weekends they walk all over you oh yeah <laughs> isn't that the truth <laughs> so um and just kind of starting to put those boundaries and setting the times where I could actually work for for clients without getting too crazy with balancing the kids. Um, you know, I was taking less and less time away. So taking away evenings was my first thing. Um, I still needed those weekends to catch up. And then um and then eventually taking the weekends. But it took me, I would say, um about four years to take away weekends. It was a slow process because I believe that, you know, like, Oh, I just need to get this one thing and, and charge this lower amount. And I was, I was working like crazy and not until I started uh, my work as a value base versus just being a freelancer and charging a lot more. Did I finally find that balance where I I could work less, still make the same amount of money, um, and then concentrate on raising the kids, taking them out to, you know, the playground. So it's a, it's a beautiful day, you can go out and um, not missing any other stuff. Mm, so I'm really, I, that's really inspiring. Number one is that you were able to kind of decide, okay, uh, this isn't working for me. You know, I'm going to trim down. Here's how it's going to happen. We're able to do that methodically over time. Uh, and there's just a few kind of questions that I have kind of pulled out of that. One is that you talked about, you know, shifting from being a freelancer to more of a value driven provider. Um, that may not be the exact term that you used, but how would you define the difference? between someone who is a freelancer and someone is a value uh, provider. You know, you mentioned that you're able to raise your prices. Like just in your own words, what what was that shift like or what's the difference there? I think number one, it was shifting from being a jack of all trades to honing down on what I really wanted to do. And the other is to to niche down and not just take every job um, just because you can, but really decide on what jobs are going to be the most value to you and bring the most value to you, to your business. Um, and then also getting that sense of um, who you work well with. So, you know, over time, you kind of decide what type of clients work the best with you and which ones don't. And I think you can kind of tell which ones are going to be the ones that are going to just keep telling you what you need to do versus the ones that like your ideas and value your opinions and where you can, the flow of work is so much better and moving to those type of clients um, and, and shifting that way. I 
feel that I could get from the freelance to the, this is what I offer. This is what I do. And if it doesn't fit your box, then, you know, we can work with someone else. Mm. Okay, so what I'm hearing there is a few different elements in this transition. One is uh, basically deciding that if I'm understanding you correctly, you are going to become kind of like a specialist in like a specific field, you know, Um, you know, you picked a particular audience that you wanted to work with and a particular kind of like set of problems that you wanted to solve and looked for people who wanted to hear your expertise on that rather than people who just wanted to like use your skill to fulfill their desire or need, uh, whatever it was, without necessarily like accessing the, you know, special knowledge and expertise that you have behind it. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? Exactly. And then also not saying yes to everything too. You know, of course I could do yeah. your social media. <laughs> of course I could maybe write your content, but is that what I really want to do? <laughs> you know, is that mm. so... And and knowing yourself and knowing what you excel at um, and just trimming down, trimming down the fat, trimming down Mm -hmm. what you don't really love, love, love doing. And Mm. And how this, and I still have lots of questions. But <laughs> um, so, you know, you mentioned trimming down what you don't want to be doing and saying no to more things. Now, have you found any challenges in that as a solopreneur? Like, do you just have to say no to like a whole heck of a lot? Or do you know, uh, do you know, like, uh, cross reference people or like recommend them to other people? Or do you work with like, uh, you know, like partnerships or something like that? Like how let's get real about saying no. (laughs) Is it really just that? Like, do you just say no uh, to a lot more things? Yeah. So when when I first speak to a client, I, I tell them that, you know, I'm, I will do your branding and get you up and running. But once we start getting to the social media, or, um, any of the SEO, I have partners for that. And what I want to do is strategize with you what's going to be the best bang for your buck to get you up to where you want to be and give you different strategies of where you can spend your money so that you can excel your business and grow your business the way that works the best for you. But I kind of throw out all the options. So then that way, um, they feel more comfortable, they feel that I'm on their side, and they like that I can give them like the, you know, cheapo VA option that they can do themselves or hiring people that can do it for them. And or, Mm. or building up to that too. Yeah, yeah. So when I'm hearing expertise, it sounds like partially just your awareness in the industry, helping people get matched to what's best for them, even if that's not you, and kind of understanding that you've chosen and have evolved to be best for them when it comes to, you know, certain areas of focus or, you know, uh, even in terms of helping them just understand and strategize, as you said, and understand what the path towards their goals is. Uh, If I'm hearing correctly, sometimes the path to get them to their goals that you're helping them identify is not with you. Sometimes it's, you know, doing something themselves or working with a different service provider or working with you until they get to a certain point and then moving on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I want to take us back a little bit to this idea of kind of weaning people off of expecting your evenings and weekends, because I think this is something that's really relevant for a lot of our listeners. You know, we talk a lot about like training your clients. Um, So when you, you know, you you said it to take you a while, several years to kind of go from working all the time forever whenever you could, which also sounds like, you know, as your kids grew up and had more stability in terms of when they're awake and sleeping and doing things. Um, That probably affected things as well. But what did that look like for you? Did you just say no? Did you just uh, like take on different clients who didn't expect that of you? Like what was that process of kind of weaning people off of your evenings, then your weekends? Was it uh, just weaning them off of communication or weaning yourself off of working at all? Oh my gosh, it was so hard because (laughs) I think mostly I had to train myself first. So, Mm. you know, the, the, when you're working with a lot of solopreneurs, all they want to do, you know, 
the time that they have is usually at night. So it's something that they're developing after work hours. So they're working at night, they're working on the weekends. So that's when they contact you and, you know, they, they may have a quick question or they may find a, a concept that they're really interested in and want your opinion. And you just have to kind of hold yourself back like, I will answer that on Monday, or I will try to answer that at, at 8 a.m. the next morning. And it's hard to because sometimes when it's a fun client that you really enjoy working with, you want to respond to them right away. And then yeah. the fact that more and more clients love texting that's that's kind of hard too because you gotta train yourself not to slippery slope, <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. Like you know, you you get that text message and you want to instantly message them back, but training yourself to not respond right away that was that was definitely difficult as well. And then I think, yeah, I could see that. Yeah, and I think that they get it because you know, even if they say, "Oh, I haven't received your." your email back about the messages that I sent it's like, Oh, you know, no worries. I, I just am opening up your emails now because I closed shut down my computer at six and I don't look at it during the weekend. It's like, Oh, yeah, no, I totally respect that. So they get it. Mm. Um, but you know, every client will try to get in there and <laughs> try to slip in there if they can. <laughs> and so it's really up to you. It's like, it's not that you're training the clients because they'll try to get in. It's you training yourself to not respond because in the society that we live to now, everybody wants that instant messaging and getting in touch with people. And, and to keep your own sanity, you just have to be like, nope, this is my time. This is what time I allocate for the clients. And that's where we have to leave it. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I love what you're saying about how, you know, we talk about training the client, but really, it's about training ourselves. Um, because I think, you know, we get that kind of dopamine hit of being like, okay, cool, I responded good. Um, and almost thinking, oh, cool, I've saved myself that work for later. When in reality, sometimes you're perpetuating <laughs> a lot more work um, than you might have to otherwise, because you know, you're tired, or you're not in the right headspace, you don't have your stuff open in front of you as well, all these different things that make it, you know, not always, <laughs> uh, not always better to answer sooner, even though our brain and society kind of tells us, oh, sooner is better. Absolutely. And like you said, that instant gratification. Or you and if I'm, yeah, what I'm hearing from you as well, in terms of uh, texting versus email, I mean, email, uh, you know, there's, there's like apps and stuff that you can use to like send later, but a text message just feels so I don't know. I feel uncomfortable if I don't answer a text message for like two days or something like that. You know, if it's like Friday night when they text me. <laughs> it's, I know it's so, it's so true, but it, it, there's so many times where I've gone down that rabbit hole of texting where it's like, Oh, a quick question, you know, and they're like, okay, sure. And then they text you. And then all of a sudden an hour and a half later, you're like, Oh, I was just texting during my off hours and I wasn't supposed to be doing that. And this could be yeah. totally waited until Monday because it wasn't that urgent. Yeah. So yeah, totally. And then that knocks you out of like, I, I find uh, I've definitely been finding these days as I uh, kind of counterbalance my work and personal lives back the other way so that I'm actually spending more time kind of in my personal life than immersed in work is that that can totally throw me off of whatever I'm working on um, in that moment as well. You know, I'll be like, Oh, great. It's like, relax time. I got like an hour and a half to like have a bath or something like that. And next thing you know, you're half an hour deep into a text conversation feeling kind of stressed and it's hard to get yourself back out of that and back into you know maybe not a bath maybe making dinner for your family or something like that but uh still quite takes a long time to like get back into that headspace of not being in the work headspace yeah no absolutely and even in working on your business i find that um, you also have to have that discipline too. So in the mornings, I also try not to answer emails or text messages um, before 8.30 a.m. so that I could have that block of time of quietness of like working on the like those critical, like either uh, I'm 
doing some programming or I'm writing a proposal where I just need to be very focused on what I'm doing and mm-hmm. having that discipline mm-hmm. as well to do it that time because you you answer one email and then all of a sudden you're looking at other emails and that's it. Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> then it's all, all all heck breaks loose at that point. It's uh yeah, it's emails like ah, it's like Coke or something like <laughs> that, like the soft drink. You know, it's like you know it's not super good for you, but if you start drinking it all the time, then all of a sudden you're wanting it all the time and. Yeah. And, and it feels so satisfying, right? I don't know. I, I actually don't really drink Coke the soft drink and haven't for a long time, but uh, email gets me. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, okay. So we've talked a little bit about uh, kind of where you started and how this has evolved uh, and how you've been able to kind of set closer boundaries or stronger boundaries over time. Um, so let's kind of fast forward to today. So, you know, these days, you know, how do you balance being a mom with being a solopreneur? Like, what does your day look like? So my day um, starts at a quarter of six. And I'm, you know, getting my kids out the door. Um, and they usually are, my husband drives them to school. So they're out the door by a quarter of seven, and then I can start my work day. So then I have a full, no, I wouldn't say full, but my full work day from 7am until about one thirty, And that's the time that I, that I, get a chance to do the work on the clients, the work on the business and any other like little thing that needs to, to get in there. Um, I also have two uh, puppies that kind of distract me once in a while, but they're getting better. Um, and then from there, um, you know, it's, it's family time until the next day. Um, so the thing that keeps me, on schedule is always looking at, I do spend a little bit of time in the evening looking at my calendar and what I have to do next so that I have a clear direction on what I'm going to be working on the next day so that I don't wake up the next day and like, Oh, I don't know, maybe I'll work on this client or the client or, you know, when client emergencies come in, you know, that you have, you allocated a certain amount of time to finish a certain project so that you stay on schedule and that you have to fit those client emergencies um, maybe later in the day or allocate some time for them the next day so that you don't get totally thrown off schedule because it's such a short amount of time. I have, um, I think it's almost six hours that I have. Um, you know, compared to a solopreneur that might do eight or 10 or 12 hours during, during the day. Um, so making sure that you can fit everything in and it, and, um, I do have dedicated call days and then dedicated work days. And what works for me is doing solid work on Monday with no calls keeping my calls from Tuesday to Thursday and then working on my business Thursday mornings and Friday mornings for 90 minutes. And so far that's, that's worked out pretty good. Okay. Awesome. So, so I'm hearing that chunking your time and just being aware of what you're doing is really critical for you for this to work. You know, like knowing that, okay, this day you're doing this, these things like Monday, you're doing calls. That's all you're doing on Monday. Okay. Thursday morning, Friday morning, you get an hour and a half to work on the business. So you'd better, you know, like make it good kind of a thing. Um, I'm hearing that, you know, one of the things that really resonated with me that you said is that you try to never sit down and be like, okay, Hey, what am I working on now? Um, you try to always know kind of as you're sitting down and as you're digging into it, exactly kind of what you're doing and roughly how much time you have to put into it. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? Absolutely. Yeah. Just um, planning your planning your day the night before and just writing down the, the tasks that you're going to tackle and just, or just going over your notes of what the tasks, the tasks you're going to tackle the next day. 
Okay. And when the night before do you do this? You do this like after the kids go to bed, like over, you know, in the, an hour after dinner before you finish your work through the day before? Like, what does that look like for you? Yeah. So um, I have a, a little bit of time after dinner and while the kids are getting ready for bed to just kind of review my notes. And it only takes like 10, 15 minutes to just review and make sure. Um, and then I'm set for the, for the next morning. I know what I'm doing. Mm, that's really awesome. Now, I know that some of our listeners are probably with me here when they're listening to that and thinking, oh, man, that sounds so good. That sounds so disciplined. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious, is motivation ever a problem? Like, is time management a problem? Like, is this us? It works so well that you keep going? Or is it sometimes like, oh, gosh, I didn't take those 15 minutes. Everything's chaos now. <laughs> well, I... You know, I, I take a bigger chunk on Sunday to plan out the week so that it's not too crazy during the week because, you know, you something happens at school and your kid wants to talk to you and, and you want to be there for them. Um, or something comes up with other family stuff or you're just really tired and just don't, don't want to do it. So I think having that my week planned out on Sunday really helps so that there, if there is a day that I can't review the night before what I'm doing, it's okay. Um, I, I have a, a somewhat of an idea. So I have like a little paper calendar that has each day, each day of the week in a color block. And I just kind of write in what I need to do. And if, uh, if I need to shift things around during the week, then then I do that. And do you build like leeway? And I'm hearing, you know, obviously stuff comes up and I love how, you know, you have kind of multiple redundancies in place to make sure that you kind of know at a high level what you're doing if and when stuff does come up. Um, but I'm curious, like, how do you build when when every hour is precious? What happens when, you know, like, oh, now two and a half hours is being spent on something unexpected or taking the dog to the vet or something like that? You know, um, how do you kind of... Uh, allow yourself leeway for those kinds of things without going crazy. <laughs> yeah. So um, I try not to overbook my week uh, just in case there are things like that. So um, typically like doctor appointments, dog vet and everything um, I have planned out from the month before. So I, I already know that it's coming up and I put the work around that. But um you know, where I need to catch up, I do. And if obviously, if there's like a big project, and someone needs something yesterday, and they're paying for it extra, <laughs> you know, time and a half, then, you know, I'll, I'll take a night to do that. But I try not to do that often. So that, um, you know, you do have that time to be with your family, and also to just rest and and do something for you which is something that I think as women, it's, it's hard because you're always thinking like, Oh, okay, well, I need to get this great dinner for my family and I need to do this for my kids and I need to do this. And, and you think about everybody else except for yourself so that you don't take that mm -hmm. time yeah. to regenerate your your own batteries or like, you know, take a yoga class or, or something like that. So um, I think that that's been my mantra for the past two years is take, it's okay to take time for myself and I don't have to do everything for everyone and say yes to everything. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a big one. I, I know that's something that comes up a lot, like within our team, with clients, with listeners, with people that I talk to on the show. Uh, you know, that's huge. What are some of the ways that you have worked to make wellness kind of part of your baseline as opposed to an afterthought? Well, I, for wellness, it's one of those things that until you do it, uh, and, and make it a part, a habit of your life, you don't realize how much you need it, right? So in- Ain't that the truth. <laughs> so I feel that I'm missing something if I don't go and work out or go for a run or, or go outside or take a, a yoga class. So that alone just 
makes me want to, um, to get, get out there because I feel better. I have more energy and I know that it, it sometimes it's counterintuitive where, you know, you roll out of bed and you're super tired, but it does energize you and you feel that you already, um, you know, accomplished something in the day. So I might go for a run at 7 a.m., get back at 7.30 and I'm, I'm ready to go and, and tackle the day. So I do try to get some workouts in during the work time or do it when my kids are doing homework or whatever, or we do something fun, like take a walk around the neighborhood, but just trying to fit it in where I can, because it, it, it totally is important for just getting that, that energy. And I think that that's what drives me to do it more is because I love the energy that it gives me. Okay. So if I'm hearing you correctly, it's not so much that, you know, you have a block that you put in every single day that is your exercise time that's inviolate or something like that. It's more that because you see and experience how much, let's say, getting active or, you know, um, as you said, like taking some time for yourself or taking a yoga class or something like that. I mean, I guess that's getting active. Um, you, it sounds like you, uh, kind of more organically find yourself motivated to fit it in kind of wherever you can day to day because it energizes you. So you almost use it as a tool to energize yourself and to keep yourself, uh, you know, like happy and focused and enter. Well, I said that word already, but happy and focused. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because I feel that if, if I'm strict with working out, then I, um, for, for myself, I get like, oh my God, I missed a workout. I can't believe it. And I stress myself out where if I fit it in more organically, um, then I know like, okay, so I work out at 7am one day and then I work out at right at noon when I need a break from all the hard work that I was doing in the morning. And it, it just feels better that way so that I don't feel stressed out that I missed a workout. And just because I missed it in the morning, then that's it. It's gone. I can't do it anymore. You know? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that makes that actually makes a lot of sense to me. This is a topic that's a little bit more personal for me. Um, because I in the past when I was working a much more like high pressure, you know, those like 50 plus hour weeks, like minimum 10 hour days, all that stuff. Um, I found that I was a lot more motivated to like wake up at 5.30, get in my exercise time and have like a really set routine. And I definitely still have routines now, but I found uh, something kind of similar to what you're describing, which is that uh, these days, if I try to like push myself to do it at the exact same time every day, like my life is almost too fluid for that. And I find myself getting really hard on myself and stressing myself out. But it's very easy for me to, you know, like... Uh, talk to my partner and be like, oh, hey, did you want to like go for a walk just before dinner or something like that? Mm -hmm. And quite often, because there's no pressure there, we'll start out being like, okay, we're going to take a 20 minute quick tour around the block. And next thing you know, it's an hour later. Uh, and we've just been, you know, walking in the forest or by the ocean, maybe we decided to walk down to the ocean or something. And uh, it may not happen at the exact same time or in the exact same way. But I find that it becomes more of like a treat for not necessarily a treat because like, I, like you, I find that it, it is a bit of a baseline. Like if I don't, uh, if I don't take the time, uh, I'll start to suffer uh, after a few days. But uh, because of that, it feels like combined, like treat and self care, you know, where it's just like, Oh, great. This is something I get to do, not something I have to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because some days you're going to feel like a run another day, you're going to feel like a yoga. And then another day you might feel like, you know, hitting the weights, but, um, mm. by kind of taking a temperature check of your body and how you're feeling that day. And also what's on the calendar can kind of set you up to what works for you that day. Cause maybe you only have 20 minutes, so maybe you can do just a quick 20 minute workout and other days you might have longer to do that awesome hour long yoga class, you know? 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I love how maybe this is just because this is how my brain works. But I love how you have this like, balance between okay, these are kind of my fixed blocks. These are the things I'm doing. I have, you know, somewhat strictly, I'm like doing a week ahead and a day ahead and this kind of stuff. But that's really well balanced with understanding that, you know, things are fluid, mood is fluid, shit happens. And uh, yeah, it, there has to be some flexibility in there to be able to, uh, you know, to not just hold yourself as a robot doing the same things all the time, uh, at the same time in exactly the same way. Yeah. And I think that you're like me and just more uh, that free spirit creative in that if it's too rigid, then it drains my energy. So I need mm. that fluidity as well. So yes, I have that structure to to make sure that I get things done that I need done. But I also need to be a little bit more fluid so that I, I'm not exhausted at the end of the day, because I think too much structure exhausts me. I mean, my my desk is a awesome chaos right now. And I wouldn't have it any other way. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah, I can definitely relate to that. Although my desk has been uh, a lot cleaner than normal lately. It's been it's been kind of refreshing. But now I have a whole I have a whole house to spread my creative brain into, (laughs) shall we say. Um, But uh, this is actually this is a great topic I'd love to dig into a little bit more. um, Because uh, one of the other things that I've always admired about you is that you don't Um, at least in my perception, you don't really pay your dues to the cult of stressed and busy. Um, You know, that is, uh, we live in a big world where there's a lot of pressure to kind of be busy all the time and to do. And I mean, by nature, as a mom, um, as well as a business uh, owner, and you know, you have all of this family and pets and etc to juggle. Um, so I'm definitely not trying to say that uh, you don't take care of a lot, but I love that how you do it all with such a relaxed attitude so much of the time. Um, do you tell me, do you have any secret? I know it's not, it's not usually a matter of like secrets or quick tips or anything like that. But, you know, is that something that you've cultivated over time? Is that something that you grew into? You know, how do you do it? <laughs> I, I definitely think it's something that you grow into and it's confidence in what you want your life to be, right? So it's so easy to compare like, oh, this mom is doing this and this mom's doing that or that business owner is doing this and they're so much more ahead. And in a society where you're just always comparing yourself, you know, you're going to end up not being happy with your life if you're living someone else's idea of that life, right? So in I, I think it's finding that confidence in yourself to say, this is what's important to me. And this is what I want my life balance to be. And this is what I'm striving for it for it. So once you know what you want. You're not really comparing yourself as much to what other people are doing. Um, And then that makes it much easier because you know that you're following your own path versus following someone else's path. Because, you know, it's so, especially with the um, community that we're in, it's so easy to be like, oh, they're doing this and they're doing that. And why am I not there? But then you're like, wait a second, but that's not what you want. It's okay. Like ah. what you want <laughs> is to take the summers off. And are you doing that? I'm like, oh yeah, I'm all, I, I'm 90% there. I can almost take the summer off and, and that's my plan. And I, I'm almost there. So you know, it's doing like a, a kind of like a little self check uh, on there. And then the other thing is that things are going to get messed up all the time. And you can either view it as an opportunity uh, to see how you can do better the next time and not be so hard on yourself. Because I think that we sometimes as a society concentrate so much on, on little things that bring us down versus seeing like the, uh, 
saying thank you to the mistakes, basically saying, oh, well, I'm glad that that happened. I won't do that again. But it just opened up this other window that I didn't even see because I made that mistake. So thank you, mistake, for coming into my life. And just kind of taking that approach, because I I feel that, um, at least for me, you know, things happen for a reason. And if your life is, is moving you in a different direction, that's okay. Go with the, go with that flow. You don't have to stick to a certain path because you, you know, your path, you don't have to follow anybody else's path. I think that's so, so, so powerful. Uh, You know, I've heard the quote, and hopefully I'm not butchering it, that says that comparison is the thief of joy. Uh, And that's one of the kind of gold nuggets. That's one of the things I'm pulling out of what you're saying is that it can be tempting to compare your life to other people's lives and think, oh, why haven't I achieved that yet? Um, Why does it look different? You know, why am I here when I maybe I desire to be there? Um, But what I'm hearing from you is that it's important to do some work to detach yourself or perhaps filter what you're perceiving from other people and, uh, you know, uh, almost like fact check those feelings and thoughts and ask yourself, okay, but where am I relative to where I desire to be? You know, um, where am I along my path? How is this meeting my goals? And I'm hearing that it, that's a two way street. It's not just about, oh, okay, I can pat myself on the back because uh, I am, yeah, as you said, you know, like maybe I'm uh, haven't grown this much, or maybe I'm not making this much money, but I'm getting my summers off, which was actually my original goal, you know. But also that even the mistakes and failures along the way, and I know this is something we've been talking about a lot. Um, this uh, Q one at Anansi is uh, this idea of failing fast and making failure part of the conversation, part of the experience. Um, you know, I love what you're saying about being able to thank your failures and be like, okay, thank your mistakes and be like, okay, thank you. You have taught me that this is not a direction I want to go in, or this is something that's not supporting my goals, or quite simply that I don't want to do this again, or maybe that it's okay to do this again. Um, I think that is something that we often uh, forget. I'm starting to hear it more and more kind of in our community and in our circles, uh, this idea of, yeah, failure and mistakes being part of what leads you to success, but needing to be very cautious about comparison because we can get a lot of inspiration and support for other people, but we can always uh, be constantly holding ourselves up to a standard that is maybe not our own or not perpetuating our best lives. Yeah, that- absolutely. And and getting lost in other people's, um, you know, other people's paths. Um, mm-hmm. And you don't want to lose yourself because then, you know, you're, you're, you're not the per- you reflect back and you're like, wait a second, this is not who I wanted to be. This is not what I want. Why am I not happy? So it's just Mm. really important to just be true to your yourself and know in your heart what you want to do and what makes you happy and what brings that balance to your life. Yeah, you know, it's funny that you mentioned this. um, And we are unfortunately, because I love talking to you, um, reaching that time where it's time to wind down. But I I just wanted to share a quick story, um, which is uh, over the weekend, I've been uh, up house sitting um, for my partner's mother. And uh, she lives in a super, super isolated rural place, uh, even more so than uh, my little small town in the forest here, those of you who have uh, heard me talk about where I live, um, that actually has no reception and crappy internet. Let's just be real. Um, and, uh, and so I had been entertaining myself by going for walks and watching the birds and doing all this, having long baths. I love bath, all this different type of stuff. And, uh, and then I hurt my knee, um, not bad enough that it was like really concerning, but bad enough that I was limping and was basically ordered to sit down for the day, um, by my partner. And uh, one of the things that I ended up doing is I ended up picking up my phone and uh, just I was like, okay, well, I haven't been spending as much time like in computer world lately. There's some stuff I need to do for the house. You know, I need to pick some curtains. I want to get some pictures printed. Great. I'm just going to sit down and have some tech time. And I proceeded to spend the next like probably six or eight hours, including in the bath (laughs) and, uh, you know, putting ice on my knee, all this different type of stuff, like immersed in that world. And 
I realized that it was just so familiar. Like it felt mm-hmm. good because it was familiar. But the next day I woke up and my knee actually felt great. And instead of finding myself like the day before where I'd been chomping at the bit to, you know, go for a long walk or do all sorts of other things, um, I found myself just flopping down where I'd been the day before and yanking out my phone. And I suddenly realized that even though what I'd spent the day doing was familiar, even though it was something I'd done literally countless times, it had been utterly exhausting to me and didn't actually make me happy. And when I reflected on it, I was like, I'd been patting myself on the back being like, great, I got all that stuff out of the way, etc. But I realized that there was actually nothing stopping me from getting it done over a period of a few days, over a period of a few weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, And so where I'm going with this is that I had this really strong realization that what was familiar and felt good because it was familiar actually was a pretty good reminder that that's not what I desired my life to be. And then I had a moment, of course, of like guilt where I was like, oh, but you know, like, you know, my team is spending like all their days on the computer and I used to spend this time and, you know, like my family needs me to do this stuff and all this head trash, as I call it, that went through my head. Um, And I started like comparing myself to a whole bunch of people. And then I was like, wait, 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 wait. And it's just, this was just yesterday. So, you know, what you're talking about, Natasha, is just so resonant for me because that was my reality check. And I am, uh, you know, a little bit embarrassed, but, uh, you know, I'm just going to be real. Like, it sounds like a momentary thing, but it actually took me a good chunk of the day and a spot of conflict with my partner to get over that kind of like depressed feeling and that feeling of being, you know, like stuck in like productive stress mode. Like if I, my, you know, my time doesn't have value unless it's being productive to someone was I think Mm -hmm. the like headspace I was in. But it reminded me that this isn't my path, you know, like this has been my path in the past, but this isn't actually what I desire to my life to look like. You know, I am much more on the uh, fire path. I want financial independence and retiring early so I can spend all of my time going for walks and camping and contributing in the community and all this different type of stuff. And, you know, those are my personal goals, you know, not anyone else's. And uh, and it took me kind of reminding myself of that and reminding myself that it's okay to do these things. But anyway, I just wanted to point out that that idea that what you spend your time doing and feels good because it's familiar isn't necessarily um, what is going to make you happy in the long term or what is making you good or strong on the path that you're deciding to walk. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's so easy to get into that familiar um, and, and miss out on the things that really make you happy. So um, you know, I, I can't say how many times on the weekend I'm like, Oh, I'm going to paint this weekend. And then all, all of a sudden everything just goes, the the weekend goes by and I haven't paint, picked up a paintbrush yet. I'm like, ah, maybe next weekend, but you know, cause you get into that familiar of, Oh, I'll putz around and do this, or I need yes. to do that, or this needs to get done for the house and this. And in reality, it doesn't need, it doesn't really need to get that. You can take out that just that little bit of time, even if it's 20 minutes to do something that you love. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, And in fact, and this I've repeated in other episodes, and I'll repeat it again, is that it might actually be- make you better and more effective at working, providing for your family, getting chores done, making major improvements, etc. to take that time to be creative or to take that time to, you know, rest and be yourself or just exist or any of that. Go for a walk, visit some trees, visit the ocean, etc. whatever it is you like to do. Um, anyway, I do want to respect your time here, Natasha, and uh, respect your schedule. <laughs> so I am going to wind us down. Um, I have a few lightning round questions here. Um, but before I get into them, was there anything else that you wanted to share? Or that I mean, I, I could keep going with questions forever. But is there anything that I missed or that you wanted to share? Or any advice you have for people who are trying who, who share your dream and share your path, you know, of uh, keeping their work time? Uh, uh, under boundaries so they can focus on other parts of their life? Um, I would say the the only other thing is to know, 
you know, what your currency is, you know, is your currency time? Is your currency being more creative? Is your currency, you know, building your business and knowing that that's what you're, you're striving for because not everybody's currency is, you know, making multi-million dollar business. My currency is taking the summer off and working towards that. So that's what I, I view as um, my main priority and what I'm working for. And that's how I measure my success. So yeah, knowing your currency. Mm, I love that. Know your currency. Understand how you measure success. Is it in, you know, money made? Is it in business growth? Is it in a happy team? Or is it in, you know, taking summers off? Is it in making sure that you have enough time to go for an hour and a half long wander down to the ocean a few times a week? Uh, You know, like these things these things make a big difference and they're different for every one of us. So thanks, Natasha. That's, that's really beautiful. All right. Ready for some quick rapid fire lightning round questions? Yes, let's go. Okay. <laughs> awesome. So question number one, what gets you up in the morning? Oh, besides a big, strong cup of coffee, um, I would say um, just knowing what the, what, uh, the day will bring and um, working on the stuff that I love, helping my my kids and having that one on one time with my husband at night. That's what gets me up. Awesome. So so basically your life. Yeah, my like life. that's like can we just like take a moment like listeners and like reflect on this uh, idea of building a life you don't need a vacation from and we're not saying that you don't enjoy a vacation now and then but like that's awesome. What gets you up in the morning is literally like what you're going to be doing that day. So that's great. Um okay, what is the number one thing that you do to preserve your wellness? Uh, making sure that I'm try to be active every day. So that might be a walk that might be just taking a step outside um, or, or getting to the gym, but just taking that time to, to move. Yeah. Yeah. That's one that's getting bigger and bigger for me. I've realized, oh gosh, (laughs) I have a lot of energy. (laughs) It's better if I nurture it. Um, Okay. And uh, last lightning round question. What is the weirdest habit that you have that contributes to your success? Uh, I would say the weirdest habit, and and I and probably other people might do this too. But I have a special bracelet that I go from, uh, that I put on when I'm ready to work, and I'm like, okay, I'm in work Natasha mode, and this is you know my ultra persona of doing the work, and then I just take it off when I'm ready to pick up the kids, and I I leave that behind. So it's kind of like okay, office is closed, the bracelet's off. So that's my little weird trick that I do for myself. (laughs) Ooh, that's awesome. I've heard of people who have kind of like a trigger song, like in the mornings and evenings. It's like, okay, when I play this, yeah, I'm in this mode or otherwise. So that's that's really cool. I like that idea of, uh, you know, your work and your personal life are fairly fluid and integrated with each other, but you're able to, you know, put aside your work zone, uh, put aside, take off your work hat and put on uh, put on your family hat. Yep. That's pretty cool. Awesome. That's that's really great. And I, and I just want to say, you know, it's been a few months since last time we saw each other, but I am still on your home hat train. Um, for our listeners, Natasha got me on to like several video games and board games and stuff. She's like, oh, you want to be working less? You want to play more games? Here, try these. And <laughs> you don't even know what you started in my household. <laughs> Like, it's all like puzzles and games and audiobooks and doing stuff. And uh, we've been, we've just beca- basically become hermits and just play at home all the time. Oh my gosh, that's <laughs> so awesome. That's so awesome. And I have many more games too. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't want to derail this conversation too hardcore, but uh, definitely, uh, yeah, they, uh, Eric has made short work of at least one of the video games. <laughs> that, uh, we've been playing. Awesome. Um, okay. But uh, just last but not least, you know, can, is there anywhere, you know, if our listeners want to find out more about you, um, that kind of a thing, where can they do that? 
So um, to find out more about what I do, I have uh, website wellnesscoachnv.com and also my um, regular website, which is the nvwebdesignstudios.com. Okay, awesome. And as usual, we will uh, connect to all of this stuff in the show notes um, and uh, link out to your site. Uh, honestly, Natasha, this is this has just been lovely. I mean, any chance to just hang out and have a conversation with you for an hour is a treat. Um, but it's also really, really nice to dig into your life and how it works. And, uh, you know, I think this is a topic that uh, is if not the word on everyone's lips, like I think is just so real for everyone. Like we all have families of one form or another. We all have goals of one form or another. How do you make it all work together? Um, and uh, so this is, yeah, this has just been a real treat. Absolutely. Me. me too. Me too. Always love it. Always a pleasure. Yay. Yay. Well, maybe you'll let me dig into your brain more uh, in a few months or something. We can have you back as a guest and ask some of the questions I didn't get a chance to today. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thank you, Natasha. And thank you, listeners. As always, I hope you have an amazing day. And that does it for another amazing episode of the Say It Online podcast. Join us next week. And don't forget to like and subscribe, whether it's iTunes, whatever your favorite podcast player is. It is always, always appreciated. It really makes a difference for us. It helps us get this word out to more people. As always, this episode was brought to you by our sponsor and Say's own business, Anansi Content. If you're a digital agency owner and you're still wasting too much time chasing down content that maybe isn't even all that great, let's talk. We've spent years working on the best process for selling, planning, and delivering amazing conversion content for your client projects. Better yet, we moosh our process to yours so that your client and you have a seamless and amazing experience the entire time through. If you're interested, just go to our website. That's www.anansicontent.com. That's A-N-A-N-S-I content.com. And just click Let's Talk. I'd love to chat with you. Someone else on the team would also love to chat with you too. Hope you have an amazing rest of your day.